What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Teach Days. Shame the secrets. This time it's the Rogue Blood Trick. Now, unfortunately, I prefer to skip this chapter because I hate the Quidditch. Right? I always hate Quidditch matches. Never really been the biggest fan of them. But it is what it is. It is part of the book. And it probably has some important shit in it, so you might as well read it. So, chapter 10, The Road Bludger. Or maybe The Rouge Bludger? Bludger? Road, the Road Bludger. Since the disastrous episode of Pixies, Professor Walker has not had not brought live creatures to class. Instead, he read passages from his books to them, and sometimes reenacted some of the more dramatic bits. He usually picked Harry to help him with these reconstructions. So far, Harry has been forced to play a simple Transylvanian villager <clears throat> whom Walker had procured with babbling curse. A yeti with a head cold, and a vampire who had been unable to eat anything except lettuce since the walker had dealt with him. What up, Ninja? Harry yeah, was also the front of the class during the very next defense, of the get defense against the Dark Arts Council, this time acting a werewolf. If he hadn't had a very good reason for keeping Walker in a good mood, he would have refused to do it. My slob how about it? Exactly. And then, don't believe it, I passed like this, slammed him to the floor, thus, with one hand, I managed to hold him down. With my other, I put my wand to his throat. I then screwed up my remaining strength and formed the immensely complex Formopheus charm. He let out a piteous mark. Go on, Harry. Harry, higher. Do that. Good. The fur vanished. The fangs, the fangs shrank. He turned back into a man. Simple yet effective. And another village will remember me forever as a hero who delivered them from a monthly terror of werewolf attacks. The bell rang and Walker got to a seat. Homework. Pose a poem about my defeat to the Wagga Wagga Well. Sign copies of Magical Means, the author of the best one. The class began to leave. Harry returned to the back of the room, where Ron and Wayne were waiting. Okay. Wait till everyone's gone. All right. <clears throat> she approached Lockhart's desk, a piece of paper clutched tightly in her hand. Harry and Ron were right behind her. Hey. Professor Lockhart, on my understanding. I wanted to, to get this book out of the library. Just for back here and reading. She held out a piece of paper, her hands shaking slightly. But the thing is, it's in the restricted section of the library, so I need a teacher to sign for <clears throat> I'm sure it would help me understand what you said in Gadding with Ghouls about slow acting venoms. Ah, Gadding with the Ghouls, said Lockhart. Taking their note from her mining and smiling widely at her. Possibly my very first book. You enjoyed it? Oh, yes, said her mind eagerly. So clever the way you chopped that last one with a tea stand, huh? trainer. Well, I'm sure no one will mind giving the best student of the year a little extra help, said Lockhart warmly. And he pulled out an enormous peacock quill. Yes, nice, isn't it? <clears throat> he said, misreading the revolt of Luke on Ron's face. I usually save it for excitement. He scrawled an enormous loopy signature on the note and handed it back to Hermione. So, had it, said Walker, while Hermione folded the note with fumbling fingers and slipped it into her bag. Tomorrow's the first Quidditch match of the season, I believe. Griffin doled against Vithering, is it not? I hear you're a useful player. 
I was a secret too. I was asked to try out the natural squad, but before my preferred to dedicate my life to the eradication of the dark forces. Still, if you ever feel the need for a little private tutor, turn, don't hesitate to ask. Always happy to pass on my expertise to less able players. Harry made an indistinct noise in his throat and hurried off after one man. You can't believe it, he said as the three of them examined the same trial event. He didn't even look at the book we wanted. That's because he's a brain skit, said Ron. The whole cast, we've got what we need. Good. He is not a brain skit, said Hermione. Surely, as they half ran toward the library. <clears throat> Just because he said Lord oh, was a best student of the year, they dropped their voices as they entered the muffled stillness of the library. Madame Fence, the librarian, was a thin, irritable woman who looked like an under underfed vulture. Must they put on the potions? She repeated suspiciously, trying to take the note from Hermione, but Hermione went out like, yeah. I was wondering if I could keep it, she said breathlessly. Oh, come on, said Ron, wrenching it from her grasp and thrusting it at Madame Prince. Prince. <clears throat> we'll get you another autograph. The left card will sign anything if it stands still long enough. Madame Prince held the note up to the right. As I, trying to determine, as I determined to detect a forgery, but it passed the test. She stepped away between the lofty shelves and returned several minutes later, carrying a large and moldy looking book. Hermione put it carefully into her bag <clears throat> and they left, trying not to walk too quickly or look too guilty. Five minutes later, they were barricaded, moaning myrtles out of water bathroom once again. Hermione had overridden Ron's objections by pointing out that it was the last place anyone in the right mind to go. So they were guaranteed some privacy. Morning Myrtle was crying noisily in her stall, but they were ignoring her. And she then. <clears throat> Hermione opened musty potente potions carefully. And the three of them bent over the damp, spotted pages. It was clear from a glance why it belonged in the restriction section. Some of the potions had, had effects almost too gruesome to think about. And there were some very unpleasant illustrations, which included a man who seemed to have turned, been turned inside out and a witch spreading several extra pairs of arms out of her head. Here it is! Said Hermione decidedly, and she found the page headed for the Poly Juice Potion. It was decorated with drawings of people halfway through transforming into other people. Harry sincerely hoped the artists had imagined the looks of intense pain on their faces. This is the most complicated potion I've ever seen, said Hermione as they scanned the recipe. Lacewing flowers, leeches, rockswood, and nut grass, she murmured, running her finger down the list of ingredients. Well, but easy enough, then students store tempest, we can help ourselves. And look, powdered horn of bicorn, don't know where we're going to get that. Shredded skin of boom slang, that would be tricky too. <clears throat> and of course, a bit of whoever we're trying to want to change into. Excuse me, said Brian Sharper. What do you mean? A bit of who I've ever turning into. I'm telling you nothing with Kadab's toenails in it. Hermione coughed as though she had heard him. We don't have to worry about that yet, though, because we had those bits last. Ron turned, speechless to Harry, who had another word. Do you realize how much we're going to steal Hermione? Try to skin a boom slime? It's definitely not the most of this cupboard. What are we going to do? Break into Snape's private stores? 
I don't know if, that, if this is a good idea. Hermione shook the book with a snap. Well, you two are going to chicken out fine, she said. There were bright pink patches on her cheeks, and her eyes were brighter than usual. I don't want to break rules, you know. I think that threatening motherborns is far worse than bringing up a difficult patient. But if you don't want to find out if it's my boy, I'll go straight to Madame Benson and down and hand it back in. I never thought I'd see the day when you persuading us to break school rules, said Ron. All right, we'll do it. But no toenails, okay? Hmm. How long will it take to make anyway? Said Harry as for my looking happier. Open the book again. Well, since the flux we has seen it's got to be picked at the full moon. <clears throat> and the lace ones have got to be stewed for 21 days. I'd say it'd be ready in about a month, if we can get all the ingredients. <clears throat> a month, said Ron. Man, we could have attacked half the mugwons in school by then. But Hermione's eyes narrowed dangerously again, and he added swiftly. But it's the best plan I've we've got. So we'll close steam ahead, I said. However, while Hermione was checking the coast, this, however, while Hermione was checking that the coast was clear for them to leave the bathroom, Ron muttered to Harry, It'll be a lot less of a hassle if you just knock him up with his broom tomorrow. Harry woke up early on Saturday morning and lay for a while thinking about the coming Quidditch match. He was nervous, manly as the thought of what Wood would say if Griffin were alone. But Harry, um, also had the idea of facing a team mounted on the fastest racing room school could buy. He had never wanted to sliver so badly. And after half an hour of lying in his his insides train, he got up, dressed, and went down to breakfast early, where he found the rest of the Gryffindor team huddled up, huddled at the long, empty table, all of them upright and not speaking much. As 11 o'clock approached, the whole school started to make its way down to Quidditch Stadium. It was a muggy sort of day. <laughs> Sounds like a Florida day. With a hint of thunder in the air. Ron and Hermione came hurrying over to wish Harry good luck as he entered the locker rooms. The team pulled on their scarlet Gryffindor robes, then sat down to listen to Wood's usual pre match pep talk. So Slytherin has put up grooms and us, he began. <clears throat> no point denying it. But we've got fat of people on our browns. We've trained harder than they have. We've been flying in all weathers. Too true. Too true. Too easy. Muttered. I haven't been drunk up with you since August. And we're going to make them rue the day that will build a slime mouth away. By his way up to their team. Just heaving his emotion, the wood turned to Harry. It'll be down to you, Harry. Show them that Seeker has to do something more than a rich father. Get to that snitch before Malfoy will die trying, Harry. <clears throat> We've got to win today. We've got to. So no pressure, Harry, said Ron. Which said Fred, winking at him. <clears throat> As they walked out onto the pitch, a roar of noise greeted them, mainly cheers. He was waving claw and Hufflepuff were anxious to see Slytherin beaten. But the Slytherin in the crowd made their boos and hisses heard too. <clears throat> Madame Hooch, the Quidditch teacher, asked Flint and Quint and Wood to shake hands, which they did, giving each other threatening stares, gripping rather harder than necessary. I'm not a son, said my hunch. Three, two, one. <whistles> With a roar from the crowd to speed from upward, the 14 players ran toward the leaden sky. Harry flew higher than any of them, squinting around to a snitch. All right, that's go ahead. 
Yeah, Malfoy. Shooting underneath him as I to show off the speed out of his room. <clears throat> Harry had no time to reply. That very moment, a heavy black bludger came pelting toward him. He avoided it so narrowly he felt it ruffle his hair as it passed. Close one, Harry, said George, shrieking past him with his club in his hand, ready to knock the bludger back toward us literally. <coughs> Harry saw George give the bludger a powerful whack in the direction of Adrian Pusey, but the bludger changed direction in midair and shot straight for Harry again. Harry dropped quickly to avoid it, and George managed to hit it hard toward Malfoy. Once again, the bludger swerved like a boomerang and shot at Harry's head. Harry put on a burst of speed and zoomed toward the other end of the pitch. He could hear the bludger whistling along behind him. What was going on? Bludgers never concentrate on one player like this. It was their job to try and see as many people as possible. Fred Weasley was waiting for the bludger at the other end. Harry ducked as Fred swung the bludger with all of his might. The bludger was knocked off the course. Gotcha! Fred yelled happily. But he was wrong. As though it was magnetically attracted to Harry, the bludger pelted after him once more. And Harry was forced to fly off at full speed. It had started to rain. Harry felt heavy drops fall onto his face, splattering onto his glasses. He didn't have a clue what was going on. The rest of the game, until he heard Kurt Lee Jordan, who was commenting, Slytherin Lee, 60 points to zero? The Slytherin superior brains were clearly doing their jobs. And meanwhile, the mad bludger was doing all it could to not carry out of the air. <clears throat> Fred and George were now flying so close to him on either side that Harry could see nothing at all except their flailing arms and no choice and no chance to look for a snitch. Well, I won't catch it. Someone's tampered with this bludger! Fred grunted, swinging his bat with all of his might as it launched. A new attack on Harry. We need a timeout, said George, trying to signal to Wood, trying to stop the blood of breaking Harry's nose at the same time. Wood had obviously got the message. Madame Hooch's whistle rang out, and Harry, Freddie, and George died for the ground, still trying to avoid the mad pleasure. What's going on, said Wood, as the Gryffindor team huddled together, while Slytherins in the crowd cheered, jeered, rather. We're being flattened. Fred, George, where were you when the bludger stopped Angelina scoring? We were 20 feet above her, stopping the other bludger from mudger. <laughs> now, now, there is a uh, tongue twister chat. We were 20 feet above her, stopping the other bludger from murdering Harry, Oliver. Then George angrily. Someone's fixed it. They won't leave Harry alone. It hasn't gone for anyone else all game. The Slytherins must have done something to it. But the Bludgers have all been locked in Madame Hooch's office since our last practice. There's nothing wrong with them. Some wrong with them, they would anxiously. Madame Hooch was walking toward them. Over her shoulder, Harry could see the two Slytherin team jeering and pointing in his direction. Listen, said Harry. As she came near and near. If you two flying around me all the time, the only way I'm going to catch this snitch is it flies up my sleeve. Go back to the rest of the team and let me deal with the road one. Don't be thick, said Fred. Go take the head off. Wood was looking from Harry to the Weasleys. Oliver, this is insane, <clears throat> said Alicia, spit it angrily. You can't let Harry deal with that thing on his own. Let's ask for an inquiry. <clears throat> If we stop now, we'll have to forfeit the match, said Harry. And we're not losing the slurring just because of a crazy bludger. Come on, Oliver. Tell him to leave me alone. This is all your fault, George said angrily to Wood. Get the snitch or die trying. What a stupid thing to tell him. And <clears throat> Madame Hooch had joined them. Ready to resume playing? She asked the wood. 
Woodworth that determined, determined to look on Harry's face. All right, he said, Fred, George, you heard Harry. Leave him alone, let him deal with the bludger on his own. The rain was falling more heavily now. A mad hooch's whistle. Harry kicked hard into the air <coughs> and heard the telltale whoosh of the bludger behind him. Higher and higher, Harry climbed. He looped and swooped, spiraled, zigzagged and rolled. Slightly dizzy, he nevertheless kept his eyes wide open. Rain was speckling his glasses <clears throat> and ran up his nostrils and hung upside down, avoiding another fierce dive from the bludger. He could hear laughter from the crowd. He knew he must look very stupid. But the rogue bludger was heavy. He couldn't change direction as quickly as Harry could. He began, he began a guy roller coaster ride around the edges of the stadium, <clears throat> squinting through the silver sheets of rain to the Gryffindor goalpost, where Adrian Pusey was trying to get past Wood. A whistling in Harry's ear told him that the bludger had just missed him again. He turned right over and sped in the opposite direction. Training for the ballet, Potter! Yeah, my boy. And Harry was forced to do a stupid kind of twirl midair to dodge the bludger. As he fled, the bludger trailing a few feet behind him. And then, glaring back at Malfoy in hatred, he saw it. The golden snitch. It was hovering inches above Malfoy's ear. And Malfoy, busy laughing at Malfoy, Harry, had it, hadn't seen it. For an antagonizing moment, Harry hung in midair, not daring to speed toward Malfoy in case he looked up and saw the snitch. Bling! He had, still, he, had stayed, he had stayed still a second too long. I'm sorry, that's a lot of S's, though. The bludger had hit him at last, smashed into his elbow, and Harry felt his arm break. Dimly, dazed by the searing pain in his arm, he slid sideways onto his rainy, drenched brim, one knee still crooked over. It. His right arm dangling useless at his side. The bludger came pelting back at him for a second attack, sight aiming at his face. Harry swerved out of the way, one idea firmly lodged in his numb brain. Get to mouth boy. Though a haze of Rain and pain, he dived for the shimmering, searing face below him, and saw his eyes widen with fear. Malfoy thought Harry was attacking him. What the? He gasped, grinning out of Harry's way. Harry took his remaining hand off his brim and made a wild snatch. <clears throat> he felt for his fingers close on the cold snitch, but was now only gripping the brim with his legs. There was a yell from the crowd below as he headed straight for the ground. Trying hard not to pass out. With a splattering thud, he hit the mud and rolled off his brim. He, his arm was hanging at a very strange angle. Riddled with pain, he heard, as though from a distance, a good deal of whistling and shouting. <clears throat> he focused on the snitch clutching his hand in his good hand. Aha, he said vaguely, we've won. And he fainted. He came around, rain falling on his face, still lying on the field, with someone leaning over him. He saw a glitter of teeth. Oh no, not you, he moaned. Does it know what he's saying? said Lockhart, gladly, the anxious crowd of Gryffindors pressing around him. Not till Wiley Harry, I'm about to fix your. No, said Harry. I'll keep it like this, thanks. Uh, he tried to sit up, <clears throat> but the pain was terrible. He heard a familiar clicking noise nearby. I don't want a photo of this, Cullen. very loudly. Right back, Carrie, said Lockhart soothingly. The simple charm I used it countless times. Why can't I just go to the hospital, Link? Eh? 
said Harry through clenched teeth. He should, really, Professor, said a muddy wood. He couldn't help grinning, even though his secret was injured. Great character, Harry, really spectacular. Your best yet, I'd say. Through the thickest of legs around him. Harry spotted <clears throat> Fred and George Weasley wrestling the road bludger into a box. It was still putting up a terrific fight. Stand back, said Walker, who's rolling up his jade green sleeves. No, don't, said Harry weakly. But Walker was twirling his wand. A second later, head directed it straight out Harry's arm. A strange and unpleasant sensation started. And Harry's shoulders spread all the way down to his fingertips. Felt as though his arm was being deflated. He didn't dare look at what was happening. He had his eyes shut, his face turned away from his arm. But his worst fears were realized as the people above him gasped, and Carlton Creevy began clicking away madly. His arm didn't hurt anymore, <clears throat> nor did it feel remotely like an arm. Ah! said Lockhart. Yes, well, that can sometimes happen. But the point is, the bones are no longer broken. That's the thing to bear in mind, Harry. So, Harry, just toddle up to the hospital room. Ah, Miss Weasley, Mr. Weasley, Miss Granger, we just court him. And Madame Pompey will be able to tidy you up a bit. As Harry got to his feet, he felt strangely lopsided. Taking a deep breath, he looked down his right side. What he saw made him nearly pass out again. Poking out of the end of his robes was what looked like a thick, flesh-colored rubber glove. He tried to move it. Nothing happened. Rodkart had not mended Harry's bones. He had removed them. Madame Pomfrey wasn't at all pleased. You should have came straight to me. He raised, holding up the sad lump remain of what half an hour ago had been working on. I can mend my arms in a second, but growing them back. You will be able to, won't you? said Harry desperately. I'll be able to, certainly, but it'll be painful, said Madame Pomfrey grimly, throwing Harry a pair of pajamas. You'll have to stay the night. Hermione waited outside the curtain drawn around Harry's bed, while Ron helped him into his pajamas. It took a while to get the stuff off, to, a while to stuff the rubbery, boneless arm into a sleeve. How yeah, can you stick a block up now, eh, Hermione? Ron called through the curtain as he pulled Harry's limp fingers through the cuff. If Harry had wanted to eat boning, he would have asked. Anyone can make a mistake, said Hermione. And it doesn't hurt anymore, does it, Harry? No, said Harry. Okay, bed. But it doesn't do anything else either. As he swung himself onto the bed, his arm flapped pointlessly. Harry and Madame Pomfrey came around the curtain. Madame Pomfrey was holding a large bottle of something labeled Skelly Grow. You're in for a rough night. She said, pouring out a steaming beakerful and hanging to him. Regrowing bones is a nasty business. So it's taking skeleton. It burnt Harry's mouth and throat as it went down, making him cough and sputter. Still tuttering about dangerous sports of inept teachers, Madame Pomfrey retreated, leaving Harry and her mind. Oh, oh, down some water. Now, I'm going to add a, uh, a, uh, something from the movies. A line from the movies also in there. Which one are you expecting? Pumpkin juice? I just love that line, and I feel they it really should have been in the books, too. We won, though, said Ron. A grin breaking across his face. That was some catch you made. Mouth voice face. You looked ready to kill. I want to know how you fixed that pleasure, said Hermione darkly. We can have that to the list of questions we'll ask him of taking the polyjuice potion. 
Then Harry sinking back onto his toes. I hope it tastes better than this stuff. It looks like a bit of slithers, do not it? You've got to be joking. Say, Ron. The door of the hospital went burst open at that moment. Filch. Filthy and soaking wet. Oh, I'm sorry. The rest of the hospital wing burst open at that moment. Filthy and soaking wet. The rest of the Gryffindor team had a run to see Harry. I'm sorry, I thought I said Filch tried burst into the put it into the hospital room. I'm like, what the fuck do you want, Filch? Unbelievable flying, Harry, said George. I've just seen Marcus Flint yell on that mouth boy. Something about having a snitch on the top of his head and not noticing. My boy didn't seem too happy. They had my cakes, sweets, and bottles of pumpkin juice. They gathered around Harry's bed and were just getting started on what promised to be a good party when Madame Pompey came around storming and shouting, This boy needs a rest. Let's get 33 bones of the girl. Act! And Harry was left alone, with nothing to distract him from stabbing pains in his limp arm. Hours and hours later, Harry would click suddenly in the, in the pitch blackness and gave a small yelp of pain. His arm now felt full of large splinters. For a split, for a split, there's a new word for y'all. Split second, combine it, split it. For a second. He thought that what he thought that was what had woken him. Then, with a show of horror, he realized that someone was sponging his forehead in the dark. Get off, he said loudly. Then, Dobby. The house elves guiding tennis balls were peering at Harry through the darkness. A single tear was running down his long, pointed nose. Harry Potter came back to school, he whispered miserably. Don't be informed and warned, Harry Potter. Ah, oh, sir, why didn't you hear Dobby? Why didn't Harry Potter go back on me, Mr. Twain? Harry heaved himself up on the pillows and pushed Dobby's sponge away. What are you doing here? How do you know, Mr. Twain? Dobby's lip trembled, and Harry was seized by a sudden suspicion. It's you, he said slowly. You stopped the barrier from letting us through. Indeed, yes, sir, said Dobby, nodding his head vigorously, ears flapping. Dobby hid and watched for Harry Potter, and said the gate when Dobby had to iron his hands afterward. He showed Harry ten. Long bandaged fingers. But Dobby didn't care, sir. For he thought Teddy Potter was safe. And never did Dobby dream that Teddy Potter would get to school another way. He was walking backward and forward, shaking from his ugly head. Dobby was so shook when he heard Teddy Potter was back at Hogwarts. He let his muscles dim apart. Such a flogging dubbing and never had so. Ron slumped back onto his pillows. Nearly got Ron and me expelled, he said fiercely. You better get lost before my bones come back, Dobby. I might strangle you. Dobby smiles weakly. Dobby's used to death itself. Dobby gets him five times a day at home. <clears throat> He blew his nose on a corner with a filthy pillowcase he wore, looking so pathetic that Harry felt his anger ebb away in spite of himself. Why do you wear that thing, Dobby? He asked scarcely. Yes, sir, said Dobby, looking at the pillowcase. Tis a mark of the house that was enslavement, sir. Dobby can only be freed of his master's presenting of clothes, sir. <clears throat> the family is careful not to press Dobby, even a sock, sir. For then, 
he would be free to leave the house forever. Dobby mopped his bulging eyes away and suddenly, and suddenly, Harry Potter must go home. Dobby thought his bridge would be enough to make your pleasure, said Harry, angry rising once more. What do you mean, your bludger? You made that bludger try and kill me? Not kill you, sir. Never kill you, said Dobby shot. Dobby wants to save Harry Potter's life. Potter's and Tom, grievously injured, they remain here, sir. Dobby only wanted Harry Potter hurt enough to be sent home. Oh, is that all? said Harry angrily. I don't suppose you want to tell me why you want to sit home in pieces. <sighs> if Harry Potter only knew. Dobby groaned, more tears dripping onto his ragged pillow. <clears throat> if he knew what he means to us, to the lily, to the enslaved, we dreads the magical world. Dobby remembers how it was. When he, who must not be named, was at the height of his power, sir. We ourselves were treated like vermin, sir. Of course, Dobby is still treated like that, sir. He admitted. <clears throat> Drying his pill of case. Drying his face on the pillow case. But most of sir. Life has improved for my kind since you triumphed over he who must not be named. <clears throat> Harry Potter survived, and the dark lord, and the dark days would never end, sir. And now, the Hogwarts, terrible things are to happen. And, uh, and Harry Potter's, uh, I think I skipped a lot, yet. But mostly, sir, my life has improved for my kind since you triumphed over the who must not be named. Harry Potter survived, and the Dark Lord's power was broken, and it was a new dawn, sir. And Harry Potter shone like a beacon of hope for those, those who thought the dark days would never end. Oh, wow, I skipped by two lines. Oops. And now, I told you, Terrible things are to happen. <clears throat> or perhaps already Dobby cannot let Harry Potter stay here now that history needs to repeat itself. Now that the Chamber of Secrets is open once more. Dobby froze, horror struck, then grabbed Harry's water jug from his bedside table and cracked it over his own head, toppling out of sight. Second later, he crawled back under the bed, cross eyed mother. Bad Dobby, very bad Dobby. So there is a chamber of secrets, Harry whispered. And did you say it's been open before? Tell me, Dobby. He sees the elf's bony wrist as Dobby's hand inch toward the water jug. But I'm not mobile born. How can I be in danger of the chamber? Oh, so that's no more. That's no more than poor Dobby. Stammered the elf, his eyes huge in the dark. Dark deeds are planned in this place, but Harry Potter must not be here when they happen. Go home, Harry Potter. Go home. Harry must not, Potter must not muddle in a cell. It is too dangerous. Who is it, Dobby? Harry said, keeping a firm hold on Dobby's wrist to stop him from hitting himself with the water jug again. Who's opened it? Who's opened it last time? Dobby, can't, sir. Dobby, can't. Dobby mustn't tell. It's good, yo. Go home, Harry Potter. Go home. I'm not going anywhere. One of my best friends is a mother born. Should be bust along if the chamber really has been open. Harry Potter risk his own life for his friends, moaned Dobby in a kind of miserable ecstasy. So noble, so valiant. But he must save himself. 
He must. Harry Potter must not. Dobby suddenly froze. His back ears are quivering. Harry heard it, too. There are footsteps coming down the passageway outside. Dobby must go. Breathe the elf, terrified. There was all a crack. And Harry's fist was suddenly clenched on to thin air. Haunting him. He slumped back into his bed. Into him. Into bed. His eyes on the dark doorway to the hospital room. His footsteps drew nearer. Next moment. Dumbledore was backing into the dormitory, wearing a long, woolen dressing gown and a nightcap. He was carrying what looked like a statue. Professor McGonagall appeared a second later, <clears throat> carrying a nightcap, and was carrying. Uh, Professor McGonagall appeared a second later, carrying it to speak. Together, they heaved it onto a bed. Kit Madame Pomfrey. Kit Madame Pomfrey, whispered Dumbledore. Professor McGonagall hurried past the end of Harry's bed out of sight. Out of sight. Harry lay quite still, pretending to be asleep. He heard urgent voices, and then Professor McGonagall swept back into the view, closely followed by Madame Pomfrey, who was pulling a cardigan on over her nightdress. He heard a sharp intake of breath. What happened? Madame Pomfrey whispered to Dumbledore, bending over the statue to the head. Another attack, said Dumbledore. Another phantom on the stairs. There was a bunch of grapes next to him, said Professor McGonagall. Who think he was trying to sneak up here to visit Potter? Harry's stomach gave a terrible urge. Slowly and carefully, he raised himself up a few inches, but he could look at the statue on the bed. A ray of moonlight lay across his staring face. It was calm and creepy. His eyes were eye wide, and his hands were stuck up in the front of them, holding his camera. Petrified? whispered McFadden Pomfrey. Yes, said Professor McGonagall. But I shut up to think. If Atavis hadn't been on his way downstairs, or had talked to him, who knows what might have... The three of them stared down at Colin. Then Dumbledore leaned forward and wrenched the camera out of Colin's rigid grip. You don't think he managed to get a picture of his attack yet? Said Professor McGonagall eagerly. Dumbledore didn't answer. He opened the back of the camera. Good gracious, said Madame Pomfrey. And yes, I know, Madame Pomfrey's voice sounds exactly like my voice for uh, McGonagall. Old British woman, excuse me. A jet of stream had hissed out of the camera. Harry, three beds away, copy ass sort of smell of burnt plastic. Melted, said Madame Pomfrey wonderingly. Oh, noted. What does this mean, Edvis? Professor McGonagall asked gently. It means, the dumb door, that the Chamber of Secrets is indeed opened again. Madame Pomfrey, cla Pomfrey clapped a hand to her mouth. Professor McGonagall stared at the dumb door. But Edvis, surely, who? The question is not who, said Dumbledore, his eyes on Colin. The question is how. And from what Harry could see of Professor McGonagall's shadowy face, she didn't understand this any better than he did. All right, and that concludes Chapter 10, Chet. Next chapter will be Chapter 11, The Dueling Club. And my goodness, uh... I am out of breath, Chet. It always leaves me breathless when I read. I don't know why, but it always does. Let's see how many chapters this next chapter will be. So from 182 to 205, 23 page chapter. All right, okay, okay, okay. We can work with that, we can work with that. 
But all right, if you guys like this video, make sure you guys smash that like button. And I will see everybody in the next video. It was up. Peace.